Hello and welcome to Awaken Empower TV. I'm your host, Ethan Fox. Today I'm joined by Brooks Agnew and we speak about a variety of subjects from the hollow earth theory to the electric truck that he's developing and energy technologies uh, and also discuss uh, ancient civilizations and law of attraction, quite a variety of very interesting subjects and his unique take on, on law of attraction and how to actually the missing parts that were missing from the secret and how to actually uh, use those uh, that understanding to to produce the kind of life that you want to create. So without any further delay, here's Brooks Agnew. Hello, Brooks. Welcome to Awaken Empowered TV. Thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure to speak with you and to learn more about you today. I'd really like to start by um, learning more about your history, your lineage. I know you've got a very fascinating family background and uh, even in royalty back uh, in your uh, native country. And so if you can start with that and tell us anything that might be fascinating or a little out of the ordinary uh, as pertaining to your family, family lineage. And, and I know you also have uh, a distant um, relative who what discovered the magnetic North Pole also, right? So That's just true. Um, of course, my heritage is Scottish, like a lot of Americans. But, uh, you know, Scotland being a small company, uh, Scotland being a small country, and um, usually not one that gets along well with everyone. We're, we're usually at war with someone. Uh, my family was a political group called the Hereditary Sheriffs of Galloway. We were sort of like knights in, uh, in a Scottish way. And we protected more or less the Western lands, west of Rosslyn to the coast. Um, my city is called Stranraer. Uh, it's uh, nestled along Agnew Bay, which uh, hugs uh, Agnew Crescent. And uh, Agnew Castle sits there on top of uh, Loch Nahan and overlooks the, uh, the sea between Scotland and Ireland. So it, the castle was built in 1340, it burned, and it was rebuilt in the early 1400s. So it's, it's been quite a heritage. Uh, with the potato famine, of course, a lot of them moved to Canada and then down into the United States. So I'm first generation, 100% American. And uh, uh, if you go back even further, back to 1831, uh, through my grandmother's line, it's the Ross line. And in that same line, and this, I discovered this sort of by accident. I had done my genealogy back to uh, a sire whose name was William Ross. And I didn't really follow his progeny very far. <coughs> but when I followed his uh, uh, progeny, it was by accident. In, um, in Weed, California, I was speaking at, uh, at one of the colleges there, and we were walking down the sidewalk one evening, and there was a bench sitting on the sidewalk. Of course, the streets were pretty much deserted. On the bench was a box, and it said, books, free, take one. So I looked down in the box, and there were about a dozen different books. One of them was an encyclopedia. It was the volume R. So I opened it up and started thumbing through it and uh, came across Ross. And I said, hey, that's my grandmother's family name. And there was Sir James Ross, 1831, who had, who had discovered the North Magnetic Pole. Well, I did a little bit of research, and he's directly related to me. And he kind of looks like me. So um, I have always felt kind of an affinity with the Arctic region, always wanted to explore it. Uh, actually became part of an expedition to try to discover the legend of whether Earth is hollow or not. I uh, worked on it for the better part of seven years. And um, finally, because of, uh, you know, work demand and stuff like that, I had to, you know, pass it up and, and move on to other things. But uh, it was a fascinating project for that, that amount of time. So that's interesting that you have that lineage back to somebody who was fascinated with Magnetic North. And I'm curious because, and we'll come back to the subject a little bit later, but what do you attribute that, that interest that you had in, um, in the recent time about um, investigating the North Pole and, and whether or not the Earth is hollow? Do you think that that's some sort of 
genetic um, uh, carryover from that uh, individual from the past? Or do you think it's some sort of past life reincarnation connection? Or um, <laughs> what, what would be your theory on, on that connection? Well, as a scientist, I have to you know, look at things from a non-belief point of view. But what I have discovered, at least uh, in working with uh, mice and working with uh, other forms of biology, that it does appear that traumatic or dramatic events are passed from one generation to the next, or at least a reaction uh, to those. Maybe a lesson learned like a maze or a stress uh, response like diabetes or something. We don't really know how, but somehow the parent passes that on to the children. Now, could that have survived four generations to get to me? Did I have some deep-seated you know, destiny to investigate that? I, I will tell you, I have taken on a lot of scientific projects in my life, and most of them have been pretty much impossible. I've made a career out of it. But I have never before or since encountered people who were so passionate about this idea that Earth might be hollow. It wasn't a simple thing like, you know, is there water on Mars? I mean, are they really excited about that? No, it was it was something spiritual. It was something driving them from within. It was almost religious, almost, you know, overcoming to them. They didn't really understand the details of it, but when they learned about the expedition, they became not just fans, they became like believers. So I have to think that there's some synergy, some symbiotic relationship between the spirit of the planet itself and the spirit alive on it at the time. And right now we have over 7 billion of us alive. I think maybe more humans that have ever been alive on the earth at one time. So there's a tremendous consciousness connection between living humanity and living earth. I'd like to talk about the, the hollow earth uh, idea in a few minutes, <clears throat> but first uh, now I know you're a physicist and also an engineer. Can you um, tell me a little about your educational background and, and really your upbringing, anything that was that might be telling as to the the course or the path through life you followed and any um, interesting or life-changing experiences that might have altered the course of your life along the way? Well, education is life-changing. Every time you learn something new, it alters not just your point of view, but it alters your ability to see things you didn't see before. So at a young age, uh, probably nine or 10 years old, I started, you know, grabbing everything I could. My brother was uh, nine years older than I was. So I was exposed to all his science books and his math books. And I just consumed everything I could get my hands on. I did a co-op at JPL when I was 17. Then I went in the Air Force. My friend stayed at JPL and then he went on to work for Hughes Satellite for 18 years. But I just uh, kind of followed whatever I wanted to follow. And it was a rather esoteric path. I uh, didn't have parents to guide me. So I just learned what I wanted to learn when I wanted to learn it. And I've always had a passion for it. So as those pieces were put together, it formed a kind of, I call it a transitory matrix, music and art, literature, history, mathematics, um, uh, optics, all kinds of science, art, religion, all fit together as as one fabric and I was able from a very young age to move seamlessly between those things and it helps me see things helps me not miss things when they show up it's kind of nice to be able to say hey I know what that is when everyone in the room is clueless it's just been a gift and it's also been a burden my entire life now, I know in more recent years you've moved a little bit more toward the esoteric uh, meditation, law of attraction, those kind of things. Has that been a challenge for you as a scientist to make that leap? It has been. I actually um, investigated transcendental meditation when I was a teenager. And uh, I suppose I had a good teacher. It did help me clear my mind and relax and finally go to sleep. But I've 
just said that just can't be the purpose of meditation. So I really didn't follow through with it later in life. But when I was 52 years old, I went to a conference where I was invited to speak and I was introduced to meditation again. And this time it just clicked. I got quiet enough to make a connection to uh, deeper processes, things that, uh, for lack of a better word, I'm going to call it a download. That's what people call it today. It was a direct connection to pure knowledge. And the difference between getting pure knowledge and just thinking about something is when you think about something, you're deriving um, the formula from known information. A download is pure information that you've never seen before. It's finished formulas, it's finished designs, finished schematics, and it takes a while of thinking about those things and listening to the resonation of the energy around you to figure out what those things mean. And it's been quite a challenge for the last eight years. Now, isn't that how, I mean, in theory, uh, individuals like Nikola Tesla probably worked, right? The, to receive that, the completed formula in their heads. I actually uh, did a study of mathematicians. I, it sounds really boring. But the interesting thing about these mathematicians is almost to a person, you know, Reeson, uh, Chandigrasar, all these brilliant mathematicians, they claim that they received finished math in dreams or visions. And then they took it to their contemporaries, tried to figure out what it meant, and it was beyond them. So they had to work from the known to, to the knowledge that they received. And we've made huge jumps in understanding other dimensions, time, space travel, all of those things that, that really changed humanity in a mere hundred years. That's how we received it. I know you've got a little bit of background in neuroscience, do you not? Or brain science? Um, I worked at the UCLA Brain Research Institute, but it was a little bit of a mundane job. You got to remember, I was 15 years old, and my, my job was to remove the brains of rats and extract the cholesterol. None of the grad students liked doing it. I got very good at it. I also got good at packing columns. So I learned how to exist in a university lab, but it was the UCLA Brain Research Institute. I see. I know a lot of, um, and I don't know if you follow this, but a lot of more recent brain science is pointing to the the dormant period uh, in in the brain, the rest periods, as being when the greatest amount of activity and brilliance occurs in 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 the brain. So, do you think that that's what's happening during meditation and and um, it, it, the experience that you had at the at the conference? Yeah, I think that's the practice that it takes. This this area, which uh, scientists called hypnagogia, it's a it's a point between sleepfulness and wakefulness. It's when you're about to fall asleep, but you're not in a deep sleep, but you're not also totally awake. The brain is extremely aware of things that are going on around it in other frequencies, infrared, ultraviolet, even radio waves. And it takes a great amount of skill to stay in that realm longer than just a few seconds at a time. If you can stay there or you can sort of tack back and forth through it like a sailboat, you can gain a tremendous amount of knowledge. And, and so how has this experience and um, the result in your work, how, how has it affected your work since then? How has it <laughs> I will say everything that I've built, every patent that I filed, in the last eight years has come from that area. Uh, if I need to figure out something, I need to figure out why uh, I'm not getting the power out of a motor I should be getting or how to get more power or more torque out of it. I think about it, I set my mind on it, I go into that zone and the pieces just fall into place. When I awaken, I go build it and it works. This is how Edison also spoke about a lot of his brilliant ideas, right? If I remember correctly, he was holding objects in his hand and he would uh, fall asleep or something, right? Yeah, and, and Edison lived in a very, you know, noisy environment. It wasn't, uh, you know, an environment that really gave you a lot of free time. In those days, you had to spend a lot of your day, you know, figuring out 
how you were going to get clean water, how you were going to get through the day. These days, all those things are taken care of for us. And I think generally society's gotten lazy. We just uh, don't use the free time very well. But I find it to be very precious. So I, I use it as, as well as I can and try to get as much out of it as I can. So let's talk about the, the hollow earth idea. And I'm, I'm curious about not only your beliefs about it, but, but more importantly, the actual science that's been done that convinces you that the earth actually is hollow. Um, and I know there's a considerable amount of work that's been done there. So can you talk a bit about that? Well, first of all, I'd like to officially repeat that I don't believe the earth is hollow. As a scientist, I have to approach it from a non-belief point of view. I approach it from uh, a data point of view, and I was classically trained like everyone else. When I took geology, I was convinced we live on a molten ball in space, and uh, we live on tectonic plates like cornflakes flowing around in a bowl of milk, and that's the way Earth is made. But uh, someone gave me a book in 2004 as we were writing the first volume of the Ark of Millions of Years called Our Hollow Earth. Yeah, I read it. I thought it was amusing. I put it on the shelf. But then, for some strange reason, evidence that seemed to call into question that old molten ball idea started popping up. And I'd say, hey, wait a minute. How can we have pressure and shear waves and shadow waves from seismic action on one side of the planet to the other if the planet's molten inside? Well, you can't. This is all made up. That's why they put dotted lines. There's no formula for figuring, figuring that out. I also started reading papers done by other scientists like Jan Lambrecht, who took the uh, information and worked it backwards from the point of reception to the point of origin you get a completely different picture of the inside of the Earth. And then there was that picture that NASA published. It was a satellite picture of Earth, uh, and what it showed were auroras over both poles at the same time. Well, everyone at NASA, at JPL, myself, said, wait a minute, I, I thought auroras were called by, caused by the solar wind. How can you have the wind striking both sides of the planet at the same time? Well, NASA was excited about it too. And they created a hurry up project called the Themis probe, which was a capsule with five satellites inside of it. And they launched it with the specific task of finding out the origin of the auroras. What caused them? Where did they come from? And sure enough, about nine months after the launch, the satellites were in the right alignment. And there was this, what they called in the article, a cosmic bullet that exploded between satellites three and four. Of course, the explosion went out in 360 degrees and went past satellites four and five out into space, past, past uh, three, two, and one, and went to Earth. And when it got to Earth, there was the aurora. And that was it. They published it. Oh, that's it. The aurora is caused by cosmic bullets. I never heard another word about it. And I said, wait a minute. I did a co-op at JPL. I know what statistically significant information is. That is not statistically significant. That's a public sidestep. So one by one, these little stones, things from oceanography, things from, um, and I'm talking about the actual biology of oceanography, weird sea life, sea life that hasn't existed for millions of years being netted alive in places all over the world. And I said to myself, there has to be another ocean, another sea somewhere where these ancient animals live. <clears throat> and recently, there's got to be an opening. They've got to be swimming through the opening into our sea. They can't really survive or know what to do. They're pretty much blind, and they get netted. And sure enough, Washington University published a paper, Dr. Session and his grad students went through 600,000 seismograms. These are the printouts that come from the USGS when there's an earthquake. They crunched the numbers, and this is a, a statistically significant population. And what did they discover? But the damping waves of another ocean underneath the Atlantic Ocean. Well, 
Ethan, I got to tell you, once this evidence started falling into place, I had to scratch off the current planetary core geology that we now call fact and put it back in the theory category. And that's when hollow earth theory was born and started competing against it. And ever since then, I've been gathering all that information, touring the world and speaking about it, trying to get people to open their eyes to, hey, we need to do a couple of expeditions here to find out if it's true or not. Just go and see. We go to the moon. We're willing to go to Mars. Why can't we go to the Arctic and find out? And uh, just, have there been any more uh, studies done on the hollow Earth? Uh, any more measurements taken? Or uh, And I know you were planning an expedition, but financially it became uh, not so viable, right? Yeah, it was about three and a half million dollars to make that expedition. And since then, of course, we started in 2006. In 2007, the Northwest Passage opened up through a freak wind and the Arctic ice shelf calved itself off and, and made that sea available for the first time in, I don't know when, maybe 20,000 years. It's never been sailed before. Um, but then it closed back up. Now the ice is about three meters thick again in the summertime and there's no getting to it by sea. But um, now we're talking about doing some LTA, some lighter than aircraft, uh, like helium balloons, setting the altitude at around 3,000 feet, which is way lower than anyone will fly an airplane for us, and then run it across and capture the cameras on the other side and see what we can see. Uh, I'm going to be reaching out to some of the high schools that are doing suborbital uh, testing for cosmic rays. They're really good at launching these balloons. I think it's a project they might be interested in, and we'll gather some more information. And so what about, is there any credibility to the stories by Admiral Byrd? And uh, I know you've researched that a little bit. What part of that do you think is scientifically verifiable or that um, is credible? Well, one of the things about science is we, we will accept direct observation as fact. In fact, that's really the definition of a fact is direct observation. But um, I have to put it into the category of personal testimony. It's unverifiable. So uh, I have read and I've watched and I've listened to what Admiral Byrd actually said. And most of it was uh, pointed to Antarctica, not the Arctic. And then I've read what an alleged diary said, what people have said he said, and it was radically different than, than what he originally stated. So it's conjecture as far as I'm concerned. And there are other stories like Edadorfa, which is just Aphrodite spelled backwards. Evidently, a man was able to walk into Mammoth Cave and reach the hollow earth by walking that way. So I went to Mammoth Cave. I spent a month there. I went to every cavern. I spoke to the staff there at the deepest part of that cave that's ever been explored is 366 feet. And I got to thinking, now, wait a minute, let's suppose we were on a 45 degree incline, which I think you'll uh, agree is a pretty steep incline to walk down for a few days. It would take nine months to reach the inner earth walking that way with no light, no water, and no food. I just could not lend any credibility to the story at Adorfa. And the same thing went for the smoky god. So how thick is the earth's crust uh, based on at least your, the research that's been done? Do you have any uh, opinion on that? I do. There are a couple of pieces of evidence. One is called the Lagrange points, which is a point of equilibrium between any two heavenly bodies. Um, the earth is revolving around the sun, so it's easy to look at the distance of the earth from the sun and the amount of time it takes us to go around the sun to get the weight of earth. If the earth was solid all the way through or molten rock or molten metal all the way through, we should be a lot further away from the sun than we are. The Earth's a little bit light. Uh, the other thing is that this point of equidistance can be measured almost to the inch, for sure to the meter. It's about 1,200 kilometers short 
of being the center of the earth, which means earth is probably two bodies, one solid and very dense, maybe 12 or 13 grams per cubic centimeter on the inside and a crust on the outside. They are co-rotating around one another. The core is moving much faster than the crust. And this difference in rotational speed creates a tremendous magnetic field around the planet. Some planets, like Mars, don't have a magnetosphere. Maybe they don't have a core, or maybe the core is moving at the same speed as the crust. But Earth does have a magnetosphere. So all of these things... And then don't forget the damping waves of the ocean inside the crust. So the crust appears to be somewhere between 800 and 900 miles thick. Inside that 800 or 900 miles is the mantle of the earth. All the molten uh, fuel for all the uh, volcanoes and everything is inside that mantle. That uh, crust undulates based on tidal gravity that sweeps past Earth, not just our moon going around, but also other bodies in space, gravitational waves that are coming from the center of the galaxy. All of these things work to make the crust move slightly. It generates a tremendous amount, a tremendous amount of energy. Recently, there were two experiments done. One was to measure the resonant frequency of the core. And this was done, it was done pretty accurately. It was discovered that Earth, Earth's core was made of almost pure iron and that it existed at somewhere around 5,000 degrees C. And the problem was that iron wouldn't exist as a solid in that kind of density at that temperature. So it, it basically threw the whole theory into question. But then a joint effort between an American and an Asian at Cambridge University, they developed an anvil press and a laser, and they duplicated the pressure, the temperature of the core, and they discovered the correct temperature, which was 6,000 degrees C. That's the temperature of the sun, and under that temperature, an iron matrix could exist. So we have a lot of... Very current information, Stanford, Harvard, Washington University, Cambridge University, very leading edge grad students and, and even graduate teams, Nobel laureate teams, that are working on new planetary core geology. And it just throws into more and more question the old idea that we live in a big ball space. So at 6,000 degrees and that pressure, the iron emits light like the sun, right? Yes, of course. It's not a fusion reaction. This is uh, electrons jumping from one shell to another. It'll be generally in the white uh, wavelength, but it's not going to have the full range of wavelengths from, say, very short uh, ultraviolet in the 250 nanometer range to you know, long wave uh, infrared in the 1100 nanometer range. It's going to be a pretty narrow band. That's why they were able to determine that it was almost pure iron. Now, in a lot of ancient stories, such as the Hopis, they speak about some other race of beings uh, they referred to as the ant people who lived in, in the hollow earth or in the center of the earth uh, that they've come across. And, and, uh, and I interview a lot of other people who have theories or are intuitives who uh, who speak about there being extraterrestrial races in the center of the earth. Do you believe based on the science that you've seen so far that the, the earth, uh, the center of the earth um, could actually um, uh, allow for life to exist of that kind? Well, well now you asked, that's the right question. Uh, is there an environment that could support life? And this is what I do know as a scientist. And I've been to some, pretty inhospitable places on this planet. If there is space there, I guarantee you there will be life. Now, I don't know if it'll be moss or single celled or if it's going to be more complex than that. It might be radically different than what we have on the surface. It for sure has a different environment to which it has to adapt. But keep in mind, this environment probably has somewhere around 1,200 miles of atmosphere. We 
have six miles of atmosphere. And then it's space. There is no space inside the planet. It's uh, the same temperature all the time. It's the same weather all the time. It, it, and I'm not even sure if photosynthesis can take place in that narrow bandwidth of light. But I would say, if it's possible, there is photosynthesis taking place there. There is a food chain. There is respiration. And given enough time and enough purpose, uh, I think it is quite possible that life exists inside this realm. Now, the Earth isn't the only hollow planet, right? I know Pluto is. And is that, is that generally true for most planets in our solar system? It is. Um, if you look at the way, and this is the theory of the way planets form. <coughs> this is the theory of the way planets form. Because we've, we've kind of looked out into space with Hubble, and we've seen various snapshots at different stages of development. Our best guess is that solar systems form out of what are called accretion disks. They're giant swirling clouds of gas. And over time, what happens is eddies form inside these and begin to collapse into planets in the center, uh, being turning very fast and having a lot of energy, uh, forms enough compression with enough hydrogen that it ignites and becomes the sun. Um, we know that due to conservation of momentum, the smaller the space that's, that's used to gather that matter, the faster that body has to rotate. We also know that planets uh, fall into three categories when they do that. One is that they uh, collapse so fast and they get so hot that they begin to spin themselves apart and they explode. The second is that the metals become stratified and they will actually spit off a piece of themselves and form a moon. This is how Mercury was formed off of Venus. And eventually Mercury broke away and formed its own orbit around the sun. And then there's a third category, and that is where the crust expands and cools a little bit. And then it expands again and cools a little bit. It becomes more and more stable as that crust begins to slow down. The core keeps rotating at its original speed and being much more dense, probably seven times more dense than the crust, it stays pretty corporal. And it's usually metal, nickel, iron, titanium, and in our case, iron. So the space that forms between the crust and the core is what creates the dielectric to make that magnetic field. So the Earth has been expanding from a much smaller size for millions of years, I assume, and now and it and that's what causes the um, the various continents to actually fit together when you reduce the size of the planet, right? Sure. I mean, if you think if you assume that the planet's always been the same diameter, it's pretty hard to decide how the continents and the continental shelves fit together. Oh, they fit together this way, or they fit together that way. It's Pangaea over here, Pangaea over there. But if you just simply shrink the planet, all the continental shelves fit together very nicely. Neil Adams did a, a wonderful animated film of how this works. Now, obviously, with the planet going smaller, everything's covered with water, even the highest mountains. But as the crust expands, and it expands by that, those continental shelves cracking apart and lower areas being formed. The wider that becomes, the waters recede and fill in those areas. So people say, but, but Brooks, if that was the case, the age of the sea floor would be radically different than the age of dry land. Well, it is. The age of dry land is about four and a half billion years old. The age of the sea floor, barely 200 million years old. That's a big difference, and it's still doing it. There are places you can go on the planet where you can still see the sea floor cracking open and filling in with molten material. Now, it's a much smaller rate now, but it is still going on. The other thing that you would find is in these mountain ranges like the Appalachians, the Rockies, the Himalayas, uh, the Andes, you would find sedimentary layers of ancient sea life, and that's exactly what you find. And so will this stop at some point in the distant future? The Earth stops expanding 
or it just will just keep slowing down <laughs> theory on that? It is a process we like to call it that's asymptotic. That is to say, the more it expands, the less it expands. Um, it is sort of like taking a half a step toward the wall, but you can only take a half a step. You never quite reach the wall, but the steps get very, very small after a while. Effectively, realistically, yes, the Earth stops expanding. But is it still expanding? Yes, it is. Now, is everything in the universe seems to expand and contract. Is, is it possible that at some point in the distant future, the Earth will contract, do you think? Uh, Earth is a pretty small planet, so it doesn't really have enough gravity to force itself to collapse. In order to do that, you really need to be the size of Jupiter or Uranus or something like that. And honestly, we haven't been watching those planets long enough to, to tell about that process. Um, those planets I just mentioned haven't even finished one orbit around the sun in all the time that man has been watching them. Uh, now, I know that um, the Earth has also gone, gone through a number of magnetic pole shifts over its history, and we've been able to measure that through core samples and such. Uh, and we are at a critical pivot point with regard to that uh, at this point, from what I understand. And We've been noticing in recent years that the pole has been moving around a lot. And so can you speak to that and anything that you've seen in the science or from your own opinion? Sure. Well, any uh, co-rotating bodies will naturally have some wobble to them. It's, uh, it's a cumulative oscillation. No, no two bodies are exactly in balance. They reach uh, harmonics or resonant harmonics that actually create a wobble. Um, and that wobble, uh, the amplitude of that is driven by a force called the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect, very simply put, is if I'm, if I'm spinning a bucket of water around my head, the water's staying in the bucket nicely. If I let go of that rope, the bucket's going to leave me at a right angle straight out into space. That's the force that is uh, creating the amplitude of this wobble. We know because we're observing Earth's magnetic field that it's kind of amoebic. It's not, um, it's not a corporal like an onion or a soccer ball. It's, it's got lots of pits and anomalies in it, which is kind of odd uh, considering that normal magnetics, flux lines are straight and uh, they're uninterrupted. But in the last 30 years, we have seen the average uh, magnetic pole move toward the Siberian desert at the rate of about 25 miles per year. This is significant. We're not talking a few yards. We're talking across town. And it has been significant, uh, not in the extreme northern climbs, but uh, closer to the equator down around Florida. We've had to sandblast the numbers off of runways and change them because the compass doesn't lead you to the runway anymore. Um, you know, three, two left is no longer three, two left. It's more like three, three left. And so what is the, um, so what is, what are the implications of that? Does that mean that we are headed towards some sort of magnetic pole shift closer than we have been in thousands of years at this time? There is a lot of talk, especially in uh, <coughs> there's a lot of talk, especially in the well, let's just call it the non mainstream science that um, the sun isn't the only thing that does a pole shift. It's kind of remarkable that we so casually accept the fact that every 11 years the north and south pole of our sun switch. We just take it for granted. It starts and ends solar cycles. But we never think much about planets doing it or what the ramifications of that would be for life on this planet should that happen. Now, what we do know is that when these wobbles occur, there's an urge to try to come back to center. But if it gets too far, it can actually roll over. Now, some geologists have staked their uh, religious PhD uh, uh, reputations on 
the idea that this could take 100,000 years to happen. Uh, some of us are saying, you know, I would rather ask the question, what if it happened in seven years? What if it happened in seven months? What if it happened in seven hours? You know, we're talking about changing the coordinates of the planet. Everything, everything that operates off this magnetic field. Plankton, fish, birds, bacteria, migrating birds, everything changes. Everything has to adapt. Birds that think they're flying south won't be flying south anymore. They'll be flying north. They're going to get lost. They're going to starve. They're going to retrain or die. And nature doesn't really have a, a good reputation of adapting that fast. Usually what happens is mass extinction. So what is, what is in your opinion, is causing this um, unusual activity to happen at this time? Is it a change in the sun's activity or is it that our solar system has moved to a more active region of the galaxy uh, and we're being bombarded with um, more radiation external to the solar system? What, do you have any theories on, on the reason for this now? Well, I think there's some merit to all of those ideas. Um, and there's another, and that is that there is another gravitational body that doesn't come around our solar system very often that's influencing our solar system and, and giving it an extra magnetic pull that's resonating with the core of our Earth and beginning to make this oscillation even worse. Um, and it goes by a lot of names, Planet X, Nibiru, you know, things like that. But one of the things that um, people that aren't astronomers, and I'm not an astronomer, I'm an aficionado. I haven't spent enough time in dark skies to call myself an astronomer, but I've talked to some of the brightest astronomers, the most well-accomplished astronomers in the world. And what they tell me is that stars, comets, maybe even asteroids are pretty easy to track through space. They go slow, they give off light, they give off infrared, ultraviolet, we can see them pretty well. Planets, not so much. They don't off gas, they don't give off light, they're cold. They don't really have a profile. And one of the things that we know for sure, based on Kepler and based on Hubble research, is that most of the planets in our galaxy and in Sagittarius galaxy are free floating. That is to say, they don't revolve around the sun. They're just zooming through space at whatever speed they're zooming through and they have whatever effect they're gonna have. Now, sometimes they're captured by a sun, sometimes they collide with something, that's pretty rare. But that gravitational pull is perturbing everything in its path. It's dragging space time with it. So the comment has been made what if a planet was moving in such a way that we couldn't see it because the sun wasn't reflecting on it? It was moving in such a way, maybe perpendicular or somewhat perpendicular to our planar ecliptic, which means you have to be in the extreme northern climes or the extreme southern climes to even have an instrument to be able to see it. The vast majority of the population of Earth would be completely unaware something like that was occurring. And it makes a lot of sense that if a gravitational pull is going to come at us from some pole, this would be uh, what we would call um, uh, an antagonistic event that would make a pole shift happen in very short order. Is there any actual evidence to support that, uh, that from scientific research or um, maybe observations from uh, these various uh, astronomers you've been mentioning that support that there is uh, the possibility of a, a large body that has not been identified in our uh, vicinity? Well, evidence of a possibility. That's, that's a kind of an oxymoron, but let me see if I can address it. Um, the first thing that we would see are the perturbations of such a body. We would see changes in orbital behavior, we would see uh, perhaps changes in the way asteroids are rotating or moving around because they're very susceptible to this kind of stuff. Uh, we would see 
the solar wind or uh, solar surface activity like filaments or sunspots react. And we have sort of seen that, but nothing statistically significant. So I would say if there is a possibility of this, it's distant. Um, and I think if it's very large, it's going to make itself evident very soon. But if it's two, three, maybe seven times the diameter of Earth, it's going to be very difficult to detect, and you're going to need special equipment like a radio telescope to even detect it. The real question is, and I think this is the bigger question that I find in the genre, is if they found it, if they found evidence of it, would they tell us? So uh, from what you've seen so far, there isn't enough evidence to support a planet X like Zechariah Sitchin wrote about. Well, I think there's enough evidence for a possibility, but it's going to have to make itself manifest in, in some verifiable way, not just one set of radio telescopes in, in this the South Pole or Arizona, it's going to have to be verifiable from more than one source. And then <clears throat> somebody, not the grad students that run those facilities, because there's no professionals there, they're grad students living on uh, rice and beans. Somebody is going to have to have uh, the protocol to be able to tell the planet what's happening in such a way that society can deal with it. So what are the implications, do you think? Um, so assuming, now we've had a lot more solar activity in recent years as well, right? Has that also been the case? Well, actually, no. This has been the strangest. Solar Cycle 24 has been uh, one for the record books. It's We've gone hundreds of days without a solar flare. We've had some coronal mass ejections. We've had some filament snap. We've had some crazy emissions off the sun but the sun's been pretty darn quiet it's not been an active solar cycle at all and consequently we're trying to correlate that with earth changes that we're seeing uh one of the things that um you know has become apparent is that um uh the sun isn't really behaving like any time we've ever seen before and our seasons although they're still coming and going generally on the right day march 21st and etc all the equinoxes are correct the winters and the summers have become more extreme we're not breaking one or two records we're breaking two or three thousand records every summer every winter northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere it's snowing in sydney it's snowing in london it's it has made the extremes much worse now the average temperature of the planet hasn't changed since 1998 but the extremes are very noticeable and they don't seem to be um, centering themselves again that is to say the very cold and the very hot don't seem to be moving more toward what we have seen in the last hundred years. Is it completely unusual? No, not really. We've had much colder winters and much hotter summers, but we haven't had this many people alive on the planet and we haven't ever been dependent on air conditioning before. So it's, um, it is a strange thing to observe. What they're trying to do in one solar cycle is to draw some correlation between the activity of the sun and not only tectonic activity, but um, weather activity on the planet as well. I doubt they'll be able to do it. One thing is for sure, Ethan, there is no agreement at all in the, in the weather science, in geology. Um, there's no agreement. Uh, there are certainly high passions, and there seems to be a tremendous amount of money to be made both ways. But I would say it's going to be a difficult job processing all this data and coming up with something that really makes sense. Well, I mean, can we even clearly say that it's the result of unusual solar activity? Because uh, could it not also be all the uh, extensive use of uh, geoengineering and HARP and those kinds of technologies that could cause the dramatic uh, extremes of weather? Well, you bring up 
two interesting points. Yeah, we could say that. Um, and I, you know, I grew up in the military, uh, entered the military, like I said, when I was 17 years old and served my time in the Air Force and then got out, went back to college. And, you know, we had one overriding theme in the military. The latest weaponry was always tried. I, I recall Truman uh, putting the money and the resources in place to make the Manhattan Project happen. And I did my postgraduate work at Oak Ridge, so I got to know one of the Marine colonels, now retired, of course, who used to be security for the Manhattan team, Oppenheimer and uh, Fermi and those guys when they came to Oak Ridge. He was their security. And when the message, after Trinity, when the message went to Truman, uh, the darn thing works. Uh, Truman literally within hours wrote the executive order, build it, we're dropping it. And even before the second bomb, which was a hydrogen bomb, was done, we had, we had to plan to drop that atom bomb. Did we know what the impact would be? Seriously? No. We didn't know if we'd light the sky on fire. But the executive order was written. No one knew about it until the Japanese saw that bright flash. So here we are in 2015, and our president has come out and said, climate change is the number one enemy we face. It affects everybody on the planet. We're going to marshal all our forces to fight it. Well, that's not done with jets or tanks. It's done with other technology. Somebody at some university said, hey, you know, we can block infrared by lacing metals like barium and strontium and lithium high in the atmosphere. We can absorb the infrared radiation and it never strikes the oceans and warms them up. I could see him writing that executive order saying, do it. Let's save the planet. And we're seeing the results of that. We see a, a lot of aluminum and things showing up on the surface of uh, mountains and crops and even in animals that have never had aluminum in them before. And do I believe that it's happening? I think the evidence is irrefutable. Why is it happening? Because somebody in authority ordered it to happen. And they're not telling the people because it's a secret plan to save the world. Yeah, I've uh, spoken with um, Michael J. Murphy and meteorologists who have observed uh, chemtrails being used to steer hurricanes and a uh, variety of other things. So, so it seems uh, obvious, at least to people who are working in that field, that, that it is being used, at least for the purpose of steering storms, possibly even increasing the size of them. And of course, there have been a lot of documents early on in, uh, in uh, our history that were speaking about how to create storms using uh, these kinds of technologies. So so it's possible then that, that the extreme weather may not just be due to solar activity, but us meddling with the weather as well, sounds like. Well, it, it could be. And those early on documents that you're talking about, I'm somewhat familiar with them. In 1983, I was developing a system called ground probing radar. And this was specifically for the exploration of oil and gas. We were successful with it, you know, in, in uh, Kentucky and Tennessee, oil exists in little tiny cracks and fissures in the ground, and it's, it's hit or miss. It's hit or miss on any farm. Uh, and we were very successful with this technology, finding those cracks in the ground using this uh, radio, radiometric technology. Um, we got a call to go to Oregon and to shoot a gas well in a town called Roseburg, Oregon, which has been in the news lately. Um, and it was kind of a, a foggy area, uh, fescue farmers up there, they grow fescue and then they cut the sod and they roll it up and they sell it around the country. Well, we set up one day and it was obvious it, gas well would really, really have helped this operation. We set up the equipment and we have to separate the equipment, you know, two or 3,000 feet in order to get the triangulation. So I sent the broadcast unit off about a quarter of a mile and we were communicating by two-way radio, 25 meter radios. 
And I asked uh, Mike to go ahead and turn the transmitter on, which he did. And about three or four seconds later, this rolling earthquake comes through, rolls my camper back and forth. And uh, Mike comes on the radio and says, hey, did you feel that? And I said, yeah, what was that? He said, I don't know. I turned on the broadcaster and about two seconds later, it sounded like a a explosion going off deep in the ground underneath me and this wave went across the grass towards you. So I thought, well, that's really coincidental. And I recorded it, but I never thought another word about it. Uh, I say never. In 1995, I was writing a paper on ground probing radar and I recalled that incident, so I put it in there. Well, it was read by a group that was working on a documentary called Holes in Heaven. Uh, Jean Manning, who then was the congresswoman from Alaska, uh, Dr. Nick Begich, Dr. Uh, uh, Flanagan, and others, and they invited me to be part of the documentary. I thought, well, okay, I'll contribute what I can. I've never done this before. When I got involved with them, I started asking questions. What exactly are we doing? And they said, well, we're, we're doing a documentary on a weapon system called HARP the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. And it was invented by Dr. Bernard Eastland. And I spoke to Dr. Eastland on the phone. And he told me about his seven patents. And I asked him, what carrier frequency is HARP using? And he told me. And my face went pale. I got to tell you, Ethan, it was like, it was like playing with fire. I, I said, you cannot use that frequency because if you use that frequency, you could create a solar tap. And they said, well, what's a solar tap? I said, well, let me describe it to you this way. <clears throat> if you intensify that beam down to a narrow beam and you beam it up into the ionosphere, you're reaching an area that's insulated from Earth by about 45 kilometers of space, dielectric. There's no ground potential there. You're creating an ion path from the ionosphere to the Earth. And I said, you ever seen a thundercloud? Well, sure, we've seen thunderclouds. Well, this is the way they work. It works like a giant Van de Graaff generator and it forms a huge amount of electrons in that cloud. But it can't find a way to, to the ground until the ground reaches up with an ion path. Once that path is created, the electrons follow that to Earth in a bolt that's really about as big around as my arm. Of course, the light from it is tremendous, and it just vaporizes, really disintegrates all the air in its path. Now, You've watched these bolts sometimes. They'll pulse 10, 15, 25 times until the electrons are spent in that cloud and it can no longer make the jump. There's not enough potential to make the jump and then the bolt will end. And then the air will come together and you hear the thunder. Well, that's from 4,000 feet maybe to the ground. We're talking about 40 kilometers a bolt that could reach the ground from the ionosphere, which is in a cloud, it's a layer around the planet, would be about one kilometer in diameter. And it would probably pulse at the same Earth rate 10 to 15 times per second. And it would keep pulsing until the potential went away and it couldn't make the jump. It might take a couple of minutes for that to happen. Every single pulse would have the power of 50 Mount St. Helens volcanoes. That's what we're talking about, a solar tap. So I said, there, there has to be civilian oversight here. We have to tell them, you cannot use that frequency. You've got to spread it out. You've got to do something else. And this is what, what was the dawn of uh, Holes in Heaven, which then became other documentaries, which became Weather Warfare and... Very, very powerful, very scary stuff. It's a weapon system that they have no idea what the downside of it could be. And so if <clears throat> lightning occurs when the Earth reaches up 
to uh, to create that interaction. Why is it that sometimes people are struck by lightning? What 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 are the mechanics of that? Well, I mean, the ion path starts somewhere. Sometimes it starts from a tree. Sometimes it starts from a person on the 13th green with a golf club. Uh, a person is electric himself. So he creates a point where that ion path begins to stand up. It doesn't take much for that cloud to be able to to spot that ion path and reach out to it. Now, a lot of times people are struck by lightning, not directly, but close. It hits the ground and comes up through them. And, you know, that'll make your day right there. Usually if you're hit directly, uh, it's going to ruin the rest of your life. Now, do you think uh, theoretically that it's possible that incidents like Fukushima might be caused uh, by using HARP technology? I have never really given much thought to that, uh, but there is one telltale uh, sign that occurs, and that is when HARP is being focused on an area, the lower atmosphere tends to take on a lavender haze. It's uh, one of the um, almost, I'll just call it the longer wavelength ultraviolet. It, it creates a lavender light that you can even see in broad daylight. You kind of have to look to the side to see it. And it's remarkable, but a few times, Haiti, Chile, and also Fukushima, this uh, lavender light did accompany the presence of these very powerful earthquakes. Now, I don't think that it, you can just aim it at the ground and make an earthquake happen. But if there's a propensity for that earthquake to happen, you can maybe create a resonant frequency that causes it to, to release its energy. So somebody once said to me in a seminar, well, those, those lavender hazes occur at every earthquake. And I said, well, stop the presses. We now have an early warning system for earthquakes. All we have to do is have shortwave ultraviolet light detectors, and we can get about an hour's notice before an earthquake occurs. The truth is, it doesn't occur with every earthquake. It only occurs with those that accompany these high-frequency stimulations. So what are the implications on the human brain? Because our bodies are electric, uh, and of course, we're affected by electromagnetic frequencies as well. So have, have there, do you have any opinion or have there been any studies done on what effect uh, technology such as HARP or even the, the changes in the solar activity are having on uh, the human brain and uh, human emotions and so on? Well, these are, these are two very broad areas. Let me say to the first that there is evidence, I'm not the expert on it, Dr. Nick Begich and, and Dr. Uh, Flanagan are the experts on what's called brain entrainment, where ELF and ULF, these are extremely low frequencies and ultra low frequencies, are laced onto the high frequency carrier. It actually entrains the brain and can cause physiological responses. Uh, loss of control of the bowels, uh, anxiety, sleeplessness, dreams, uh, a general feeling of pain. Um, it has been used in the battlefield. It was used in the original Iraq invasion. The battle-hardened Republican Guard, after fighting Iraq or Iran for 10 years, came pouring out of their bunkers like five-year-old children. Please, please take us somewhere where these dreams will stop. So yes, it can be used to entrain the human brain. Uh, solar activity is something very different. Um, I, I'm not an expert on this, but I do know that levels of light, and I don't mean the visible light like you go outside and it's a bright sunny day. I mean the frequencies of light have what's called a mean frequency. That is to say, not the average frequency, but the most intense frequency. The sun can change that based on its activity. Sometimes it's in the infrared range, sometimes it's washed away in the visible. But there's always one wavelength that really sticks out. And this can be you know, very low in the long wave infrared to very short in the X-ray range. And that has been shown to, to affect the activity of animals, herds and flocks and 
schools and bees and all kinds of things, there is good reason to believe that humans are affected by that as well. Now, I'm asking for several reasons. Uh, we, we're very much involved in all the various manifestations of the awakening of a consciousness these days. And uh, so we get messages from people all over the world who are, especially since the eclipse back in March and the one recently this September, a lot of people have been under immense stress and uh, overwhelm and just uh, uh, crazy out of control emotions. And so I'm wondering what the source of this is. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I think that uh, we live in a, a time that's unique in all the history of mankind. Um, one thing we know about you know, any biology is it takes a few generations for genes to change the proteins that they're making to adapt a human body to its environment. In 1996 or so, we started to get high-speed internet. And it began connecting people and knowledge to people in a way that's, that's never been had before. At first, we didn't have a clue how to handle it. But it didn't take business very long to figure it out. <coughs> it didn't take schools very long to figure it out. And it became apparent very quickly by about 1999 that if you were not present on the web, you weren't present in this world. Well, this created a whole new stress, a whole new environment. And of course, the great benefits of the internet, unbelievable amounts of knowledge. Who, pray tell, would have to go to college anymore and learn from a professor that was teaching information that was so old it was obsolete by the time he got out of his class. Of course, affiliated academia is still in charge of whether or not you have a, a degree or not a degree, but the knowledge, the knowledge began to change the world. And it began to change the world so rapidly that the human psyche could not keep up. It changed uh, family structures. It changed community structures, state structures, federal structures. We became aware of things going on all over the world as they have become aware of us. And that has forced the human being in less than a generation to evolve. Well, you and I both know physiologically that's impossible. So we're trying to evolve with our psyche. We're trying to evolve with our minds, with our ability as intelligent beings to adapt. And frankly, Ethan, not many people do it well. They feel that stress in so many ways. They don't eat right. They don't sleep right. They don't interact with one another correct. And then to make matters even worse, these tapeworms have woven their way into the internet. Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and all of these things that invade our privacy and, and produce nothing, absolutely no benefit whatsoever. And yet people are hooked on it. They're addicted to it. And this is having a tremendous effect on our society as well. So there are a lot of forces at work on the human being. We are seeing in our kids a whole new human being, much more aware, much more fluid, much less worried about the future, much less worried about the impact of what they do as youth. They don't plan for the future. To them, there is no future. And I think the next generation will be even more fluid unless, and I don't think it's going to happen, unless some technological reset occurs. Maybe the whole grid goes down. Maybe there's an EMP and we lose all of our electronic devices. Well, that'll cause some anxiety for a while. But I think in a very few minutes, people are going to go, ah, that's better. So when you're saying the kids are going to become more fluid, so you're speaking of a more conscious uh, individual in the future, more easy yeah. going in the moment. kind well, of. Well, yeah. And I think they're going to be connected to the past and the future at the same time, in a way, you know, we're struggling to do. We have to be very aware. We have to be very conscious. We have to force ourselves to be connected to the past and the future at the same time, but live in the moment. It's not natural to us. We weren't raised that way. 
but our kids are falling into that. They are adapting to that. And I think it's going to be maybe a tremendous change for humanity. Maybe we'll learn to live on this rock in peace. Do you think that there is an initiative, whether intentional or not, on the part of the global leadership to try to inhibit our future generations from going through this awakening or more conscious future? Because a lot of the people I interview um, feel that way because of the uh, vaccine program and now which is becoming mandatory in California next year and uh, Common Core Education, which really uh, is inhibiting and limiting the, the, the education of children today. So they actually are learning less than they did in the past. And even uh, toxins in our environment, such as chemtrails, which all seem to be keeping people where they are. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure, I do. Um, I've been involved with school boards in the past. That in the town where I lived, I had a, I had a kid in every school in the county. Uh, kids were spread out a lot. I had four children. So I was always integrally involved with the purpose of education. And I had a lot of debates with the school superintendent on a public forum. And there seemed to be an official um, stance that school is there to teach students how to get a job and how to get along in society. And I fundamentally disagreed with that. I said, look, you know, you know far be it for me to want a, a populace that's 50% unemployed, but that's not the purpose of education. The purpose of education is to teach people how to learn because we get them for eight, maybe 12 years, and they have to go the rest of their lives, not just on the knowledge they learned here in middle school and high school, but they got to be able to take the abilities that they learned here and teach themselves whole careers, maybe three or four of them in their lifetime. And they can't do that if we don't give them the tools. Now, you talk about the global elitists. Uh, <laughs> You open a really interesting subject because uh, you go back in history and look at the global elitists. You look at, let's just say, the, the society that built the pyramids. And I'm not going to make a claim that the Egyptians built them or not. But it is clear that that engineering project at Giza took at least a generation to plan, uh, to quarry, to put together, and to make perfection. I can tell you from working with lots of companies and being a consultant for half my life, no two engineers think of things alike. They program differently, they design differently, they structure things differently, and yet the pyramids stayed right on task. And the complexity of that design didn't even become apparent until the 21st century. That's how complex it was. So what keeps a project that focused? Well, it takes almost a timeless leadership. So now look at the global elitists today. Let's just take the Bilderbergs. Um, when I've watched them gather for their meetings, and I haven't been at their meetings, but I've watched them drive into the meeting, they're frustrated. They have lost control of the planet because people know stuff. People can figure out for themselves what's going on. They never could do that before. Whatever the queen said, that was it. Everybody did it. Well, we don't do that anymore. We have our own ideas. We say, that's not right. You can't do that to us. We rebel in small ways and we're uncontrollable, which is the nature of, I think, liberty. It's wonderful. Um, the point is that on a human level, from generation to generation, there really is no global elite. There is no long range plan to control the world. They could care less. All they want is a lot of money so that they can live their lives in the most luxury possible. They know they're only going to live a hundred or so years. So that must mean that there's a more timeless being alive somewhere on the earth. <clears throat> a being that has tremendous amounts of knowledge can make promises and keep them to make people wealthy, to make people powerful, if they follow the course of action. And I have to say, for about 
1,500 years, that course has not varied one bit. The takeover of the world through economic, through education, through healthcare has not wavered to the left or right, and it is almost complete. It takes a global government that does not represent the people. And I got to be straight up with you, Ethan. That's exactly what we have in the United States of America and the UN. There is no representation in the American government. Congress has lost control of the government. It's all run by bureaucracies that have a loose coalition and they have a deeper plan. I was uh, talking about the EPA the other day. Do you know they are the largest law firm in the world and they don't even run on taxpayer money? Unbelievable, the power of this organization. That's the kind of power that can control a world. The Department of Education can say, we're not going to learn our times tables anymore. Who cares what seven times eight is? We're going to teach you Common Core. Now, we've had all kinds of protests, and Lord knows we go before the school board and ask the school board, hey, what's nine times four? And they go, well, 36. How did you know that? How did you know that? Well, I mean, nine times four is 36. It's, you know, it's, I just memorized it. Aha. You have learned a core, a piece of information that unlocks the rest of mathematics for you. Those times tables. You could now think in a process way. Common Core does not allow you to think in process. <clears throat> it makes you count on your fingers. This is so elementary, we'll never get off the ground with that kind of teaching. It is designed to dumb down a whole generation, to make them not into scholars, not into people who can learn. They're designed to make people who can work. So what are the implications of this? Because what I'm seeing is there are two distinct, there's a divergence happening in our population. There is the majority mainstream mindset that willingly gets all the vaccinations for their kids and they enroll their kids in common core education programs and they eat genetically engineered foods and they look up in the sky and they don't see chemtrails. And, uh, and so this generation is producing children who are uh, going to be genetically dramatically different from the smaller percentage of the population who are eating organic foods and, and avoiding uh, these things and homeschooling. And so it sounds like we're heading into a genetic future with some uh, small percentage of the population that's going to be dramatically different on a genetic scale than, than the majority, right? Yes. And, and you bring up a tremendously brilliant observation. You know, it's said in all kinds of scriptures that in the last days, there will be a gathering or to put it a different way, there'll be a grand division. One segment of the people who are aware, awake, sovereign, self-responsible will become unaware of the ones who do not have those features. Now, you could practically say, okay, which group is going to pump gas for the other group? <clears throat> but on a very real level, the ones that are caught in that machine process where they're attached to a machine, I don't care if it's a punch press or a sewing machine or a paint gun, they're attached to a machine. They become a cheap way to make things until they break and they're thrown away. The other group is going to be creating whole new industries, exploring space, mining asteroids, curing diseases, not just treating them, and exploring the galaxy. And I think that's what we're seeing right now, the grand division. And uh, maybe the internet is helping that along because it makes it easier for us to group together. Certainly, certainly programs like yours reach out to people and one program or another, those people go, 
I get it. I understand now. And then they can make a dramatic change in their life. And that's how it happens. You have a mighty change of heart. It's not a gradual change. It's a real slap in the face awakening. And it's a marvelous feeling. Now, you spoke about, uh, at least you described it as one group of individuals being completely unaware of the other. What is that? Is that a, is that a dimensional experience? Uh, because there's, in, in a lot of the more esoteric uh, understanding these days, there's uh, this theory of two Earths going around where the Earth is going to divide into two different experiences. Some people believe uh, some of the population are going to die off. Uh, but is it possible that, that uh, maybe it's just going to be a divergence in terms of consciousness and awareness where there are, like you're describing, two different types of population who are really existing in two different dimensional mindsets? Well, I, I do think it's much more broad than that and much more powerful than that. Uh, remember, I mentioned that the earth itself has a spirit. The earth is kind of alive. It has a symbiotic spiritual relationship with the beings upon it. Uh, in our first book, The Ark of Millions of Years, we wrote about a phenomenon which we saw in the ancient writings and we described as uh, the union of the polarity. This is a higher vibrational earth and a lower vibrational earth coming together generally during the time of Noah so that you have a temporal earth and a spiritual earth occupying the same space at the same time. And one of my colleagues asked me, you know, how is that possible? How can two earths occupy the same space at the same time? I said, oh, there's a lot of space on the earth. Let's picture a five gallon bucket full of glass marbles, okay? Now you take a couple gallons of water and you pour it into that bucket. It fills in all the spaces between the glass marbles, but it fits. You now have two forms of energy occupying the same space. So what I think is going to happen is that the spiritual vibration of the individual is going to rise. That is to say, they're more resilient, more cheerful, more merciful, more charitable, easier to forgive, slower to anger, more patient and more imaginative. And that vibrational level begins to resonate with that higher vibrational earth. The other becomes more dross. They're more concerned with how much money do I have in the bank? Uh, maybe uh, do I join a group and go kill people for power? You know, this is, this is the very most dark base section of humanity that section of humanity goes with the temporal earth. And that one day, and it's coming soon, those two earths will separate. And those that are of the higher vibrational mind and heart will go with that earth into another dimension. They'll be taken into the heavens and, and go another place. And the temporal earth will remain here in outer darkness. Now, those on the temporal earth might say, well, gee, that's not fair. You can't just go off and leave us. I'm sorry. That took place a long time ago. You became unaware of us. We became unaware of you. So you actually believe that there is a physical separation going to take place between these two earths where we, there will be wars going on, but we're not going to be existing on that. Or those of us who are more conscious are not going to even exist in the same physical dimension as the, those on the, the lower one? I'm not exactly saying that. I mean, death is the easiest thing in the world. I, I've been in car accidents where I've gone to the other side, woke up in the MRI, and literally, I promise, I woke up in the MRI, saw the machine going, going over my head, and I said, oh, that was easy. There was no pain involved whatsoever. Even if there was, even if I sat there and burned for two hours. When you're dead, you don't remember any of that. What if I were to tell you, I'm going to create a physical body. It's going to have biological systems. It's going to be self-maintaining, be able to protect itself from toxins, move around, decide what to eat. It's going to respirate. And then I'm going to put a spirit inside of it. And I'm going to give it desire and will, and it can do anything it wants to do or not do. It's its choice. 
<coughs> and then one day the physical body is going to lay down and the spiritual body is going to move on. We'd say, are you crazy? But that's exactly what we are. We are eternal beings having this crazy mortal experience and maybe not just one. Maybe the earth is the same way. You know, you look at all the matter out in the universe. Let's call it dark matter. We say that because we can't see it, but maybe it's super bright. I don't know. But when it resonates just right along that golden mean, it forms a proton. It forms an electron. And it comes into this dimension. And we form elements out of it. And we form stuff out of it bodies and planets and stars and everything else. But the other 95% of the matter is all in chaos. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We're just not aware of it. So why is it so strange to think that planets also have this spiritual ability about them? Now, maybe they don't have desire and will like we do. No other animal on the face of the earth does either. But it doesn't mean that they don't have individual abilities that other animals don't have, even inside their own species. So it's an amazing phenomenon. And you see nature, society, your own family, your own neighbors change when you change. You become aware of all those changes. It's fascinating to watch. So essentially, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, you foresee the earth as going through a, a death experience, essentially, and leaving behind its more physical dense form and, and transitioning to a new experience in its more lighter or, or spiritual form, taking with it those people who resonate with that level of awareness. I, I prefer to call it an ascension experience not a death experience um maybe it's going to go back to dust maybe it's going to go back to dark matter i don't know maybe it's going to go to outer darkness and turn into a big ice rock but it's an ascension experience those people that resonate with the higher earth are going to go with it and who knows what the potential is what makes you believe this is happening this is going to happen soon that's a really good question. I guess part of it is a hope inside of me that it's going to happen soon because I know, uh, you know, my biological clocks are running low. I only got about 50 years left. I want to be alive when it happens, but I guess it really doesn't matter. Um, I just feel like in the history of mankind, you know, we've been riding horses for most of that time. Unless you talk about the last hundred years, we made it into space and, uh, now we're talking about time travel and everything else. Um, we are beginning to understand genetics. We're beginning to understand the molecular part of biology. This is, this is the power of creation. We, as a people, should be ready for this change, at least some of us. And uh, I think it's our responsibility. It's why I come on programs like this to try to take the science part and the spiritual part and put it together so that somewhere out there it makes sense for somebody where they can say, that's what I've been waiting for. I needed those two pieces put together. Now I understand. I want to go on a little bit of a tangent that uh, popped in my mind while you were speaking about that. In a lot of ancient um, uh, traditions, like in India, for example, there's this practice of sun gazing. And I know that in, uh, in Egypt, there's also a worship or there are a lot of uh, depictions there of the um, high priests or pharaohs staring at the sun. Why, and in India, and even there have been some individuals who've been tested by, uh, by doctors and even the U.S. military to the, as to their claim that they no longer have to eat food or drink liquids very much, and in some cases not at all, as a result of sun gazing for a number of years. Do you have any scientific theories on why that's possible, what's actually happening physiologically in the body as a result of solar, uh, solar activity? I don't. I do know that there are um, at least two different states of the physical body. One has blood going through the veins and the other has 
some kind of plasma. We know that when Jesus was resurrected, he came back. He didn't have to eat. He didn't have to drink, but he did so for his apostles to prove to them that he was an, an apparition. He was alive. He could he could be touched and be be uh, interacted with in a physical way. Um, we're pretty sure from reading other uh, records that resurrected beings uh, don't have to consume food. The physical body is sustained in another way. I I don't know that this state can be reached simply by staring at the sun. Now, uh, I'm curious, I know you travel around the world to a lot of ancient sites, and I've always been very fascinated with ancient civilizations, and you manage to get yourself into places that most people don't usually. <laughs> I was lucky. Yes. I'm curious, uh, of all of your different adventures into ancient sites, what are some of the most uh, incredible ones that you've seen that may, may not necessarily be um, uh, areas that have been explored by a lot of people or can be explored, uh, and in particular, even any technologies or uh, indications of advanced technologies that some of these civilizations have had? Well, I mean, by far, the most remarkable one is when I went to Tibet. I spent two weeks on the upper Tibetan plateau, which is not a vacation. I will tell you that you get off the plane at 11,500 feet and it takes a couple days before you can carry your own luggage across the room. Uh, but it doesn't take long to, to acclimate if you're in shape. Uh, at about a week into it, we visited the Patala. The Patala is in Lhasa. Uh, up to about 100 years ago, it was the tallest building in the world. And of course, Tibet is all run by the Chinese. The Chinese have everything under lock and key. You have to take sort of the government path through everything. But Maybe I'm naive, maybe I look naive, I don't know. But while I was in the Patala, there was a pair of double doors that were locked with a chain through the panic bars. And uh, I asked my guide, whose name was Punsala, he's a Tibetan that also speaks Chinese, if we could ask him to unlock the chain and let us in to go into the lower levels of the Patala. That we'd come a long way, that I'd had some dreams, and I just made my best case that I could make. And the Chinese guard sort of held up his hand and shook his head, and that was it. So we didn't push it. We just turned around and started walking away. And about three, four steps, maybe five, I felt a tap on my shoulder, and it was the Chinese guard. And he motioned for me to come back, pulled his key ring off, unlocked the lock, undid the chain, and let me, Punsula, the guy I was with, his name was Gary, and two pilgrims that just happened to be there at the same time. The five of us went in, and we felt the chain go back over the bars. <coughs> so, so we go in, and there's no lights. It's maybe just a glow coming from behind the drapes. Uh, we walked forward about 30 feet and there was a staircase and it wound in a square pattern down to the floor. I would say we were perhaps 100 feet up. So it took a while to get to the floor. When I stepped out on the floor, the first thing that I noticed in the smooth rock underneath my feet was this huge swastika with a big piece of turquoise in the center. And I said, wow, what the heck is that doing in the floor? And Punsula said, well, you got to remember, this building was built in the 6th century. So this has nothing to do with the Nazis or anything like that. This is actually the Milky Way galaxy, the way they saw it, with the turquoise being the black hole in the center of the galaxy. I went, wow. So they had these heavy drapes hanging over uh, now, the, the, the patala is made with horizontally stacked sticks. That's how they made their wall. And some of the sticks were bigger around, which let light through. So we pulled the drapes back a little bit, and there in front of us was about a 60-foot-tall 
gold structure. And I, I said, I'm going to snap some pictures. No one's watching. I'm going to take some pictures. So I took some pictures and I'm looking at my viewfinder. I said, Punzel, what is this thing? He said, this is called a stupa. This is where they interned the bodies of Panchen Lamas, one step down from the Dalai Lama, and that way they can transport themselves through to the higher dimensions. And if you look up on the ceiling, the point of this, of this stupa had a four-dimensional stargate painted on the ceiling. So when I started looking at it closer, I said, well, I understand you say it's, it's, it's a stupa, but this looks a lot like a Tesla coil to me. So I got around to the side of it and I took pictures, the other side and took pictures. And then I just, you know, kept those on my little uh, sand disc. Now, the interesting thing is when I got back to the US, I landed at LAX, I got off the plane and <laughs> I walked up to this uh, guy who was gonna check me back through, you know, customs. And he was wearing a black outfit, black bloused boots with a black beret, bigger than me, which is pretty big. And he said, did you take any pictures? I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, let me see your camera. Turn it on. So he sat there and went through 900 pictures, just like this. I sat there for 20 minutes while he did it. And then he said, got another disc? I said, yes, I do. He said, load it up. I loaded up that and it probably had a thousand pictures on it. He went through all those. Then he handed my camera back and let me through. I don't know what he was looking for, but he didn't erase anything. So when I got back to the lab in, uh, in Indiana, I had a friend of mine who has a production studio. His name is Larry Plant. And I said, look, you've got to find a picture of a Tesla coil. And I want to overlay it over this and see how close they match. Ethan, coil for coil, all the way up to the reflector dish at the top. They match. Now, here was the remarkable thing. Coming out of the dish, down like this, at this angle, were two gold flat plates that got larger and larger and larger, and they were wrapped with ribbons. And when you look at the Tesla coil and that, you go, wait a minute, this is, this is stylized electricity. They're describing electricity coming off of this thing. So here we are, you know, something that was built in 646. And Tesla, who built his first coil that size in about 1902, they saw the same thing. It's just that the Tibetans built it out of gold and laced it with jewels. They even had inside the chamber where the Panchalam is, it was lined with sapphires. And coming out from behind the head of him was a bunch of rainbow energy. They knew exactly what was going on, but they didn't know anything about electricity. Tesla knew about the electricity, built the same thing, and he made it work. That was the most fascinating thing I ever saw in all my travels. Now, do you believe that that uh, was representing a device that generated electricity or could it have been used for something else? What I believe is that both um, the Tibetans that, that established Tibetan Buddhism and Nikola Tesla were exposed to the same thing in different dreams and they were so moved by it that they had to build it. The Tibetans used it as a spiritual transport device and Tesla used it as an electric uh, generator. So, so theoretically, these two devices, which are very similar, are being used for different things, must be drawing on some similar energy or dimension. Uh, well, they must have seen right? it work. Okay. But honestly, I don't think the Tibetans or Tesla got it right. I think that there was another purpose they were trying to show to them. I'm not sure which group got closer, honestly. Now, I know Tesla was, in theory, working on time travel and, and things like that also, was he not? Yeah, that's, 
the one thing I like about the movie, The Prestige, there was a line in the movie that's so profound. I don't know if Tesla ever said it or not, but he said, if you think of one great thing, you're a genius. You think of two great things and you're a crackpot. So Tesla ended up in Colorado Springs, exiled uh, from anything except world fairs. And um, he never really got to explore the end of his capability. Yeah. Yeah, it's a shame Wardenclyffe never got uh, off the ground and to see what that could have resulted in. Um, so let's uh, talk a bit about your foray into the electric car market. And I know you've got a, a pickup truck that, that you've been developing and that uh, hopefully very soon will be available for purchase. So tell me a little about what, what led you into the automotive industry and how that work is coming along. Well, I got into the automotive industry very early. I'd say the late eighties and um, I went to work for Ford and then went right to Nissan and I helped launch uh, the Nissan Altima. I say help launch, we were about 44 engineers on that, on that project just on one shift. And I ended up running the powerhouse for that operation, but still it was uh, a four and a half million dollar launch and we ended, finally ended up building about 400 million dollars worth of inventory which you couldn't do today you just couldn't launch a car like that way today you go bankrupt you have to do what we call start stop which is you produce for a little while and sell and produce for a little while and sell so you're constantly hiring people and laying them off hiring people and laying them off and I've been in the automotive industry ever since, except for a five-year stint in, uh, in polymer chemistry and a year to build a biodiesel plant of my own design. I retired from the industry in 2006. I wanted to go into alternative energy. I just, I just felt like I wanted to. So uh, after about a year and a half in the biodiesel industry, um, my friends called me out of Detroit and said, uh, hey, you remember those electric cars you used to play back, you know, in the early nineties with, I said, well, yeah, I mean, they were fun, but not really anything practical. And they said, well, you might try building another one because gas is about to go through the roof. And, and it's true by 2008, it was $4 a gallon. It was just unbelievable. So I took a, an old uh, Chevy Geo that some guy had partially turned into an electric vehicle. And uh, I started from there and I, I turned it into a pretty nice vehicle. So I called uh, my friends in Detroit again. I said, okay, I built one. But uh, I got a question, it's 2008, it's probably gonna take me about three years to launch. Um, what's gonna be on the market in 2011? And they said, well, probably about three or maybe even four electric cars but there aren't going to be any electric trucks. So in 2009, I built my first electric truck. This was an eight foot wheelbase truck. It, and I still have it. It's awesome. It's quick. It's nimble. It's fun to drive, but it's way too small for American roads. So in 2013, I decided to go to North Carolina, uh, open a small plant there. I have about a 90,000 square foot facility. And uh, I got with some of my racing friends. We went to the, to the frame plate, which is a big metal plate on the, on the floor where we lay out race cars. And we laid out the first from the ground up truck built as an electric truck. We knew we couldn't convert someone else's truck. This truck had to weigh less than 3,500 pounds if it was gonna be practical. We came in at 3,300 pounds. We knew we were gonna to have to be able to accelerate zero to 60 in less than nine seconds. We can do it in six seconds. We knew we had to be able to carry 1,000 pounds. We can carry 2,000 pounds. We exceeded every single design parameter that our customers asked for. And then we had to design our own body. <clears throat> we started in a wind tunnel, which we have a great wind tunnel in Mooresville, uh, North Carolina. And we developed a truck that has almost no drag. If you go to our website and look at the truck, that's the first thing you'll notice about it. Hey, this doesn't look like any pickup truck I ever saw. Well, it's true. And when you drive it, you can accelerate up to 70 miles an hour, 75 miles an hour on the freeway, and then take your foot off the accelerator. And that's exactly where you will stay. 
unless you hit a hill or wind. That vehicle has no drag at all. It can go tremendous distances on a charge. So we put a 50 kilowatt pack in it just to make sure that our customers could get 100 miles out of it. Uh, we went through all of our crash testing in the last year. So all that's done. And now we're working on the advanced airbag package, which is expensive and slow, but we'll make it through it. What's, what's the truck called? It's called the Condor. That's the model platform. And the manufacturer name, what's the name of the company? It's called EV Fleet. It's uh, kind of an antiseptic name because that's our target market. We're targeting commercial and municipal fleets with this truck. Does that mean you can't buy one because you like small pickup trucks? Absolutely not. You can buy this truck and you'll have a blast driving it. What's the uh, sticker on it now? Do you have a price? Right now we're at 49.9 uh, with volume. I think we can get that price down. Um, it's not so much the manufacturing process. We have developed a modular process uh, using lean manufacturing techniques and value stream mapping guidelines that allow us to build that truck with almost you know the least amount of labor and the most flexible assembly line possible. It is the electric parts that are not ready for that kind of volume. There are no electric trucks out there. We're the only one in the world. So we stress the transmissions, we stress the motors, we stress the suppliers because they've never supplied in these kinds of volumes before. It'll take a while for them to gear up and be able to supply us, but it should change the way we do light delivery in cities forever. And so you said about 100 miles to the charge, right? Yeah, about 100 miles to the charge in, in any kind of terrain. So you put 1,000 pounds in it, you can carry it 100 miles on level ground at freeway speeds. That's about as hard a driving as you can do with an electric vehicle. If you're going to drive around town at 45 miles an hour, you can go a lot further than that. Any practical ideas on how one charges a car at 100 miles so you have to return home every time to do that? <laughs> well, it, it is a different mindset. One of the things that we learned from DOT records is the average trip for a commercial truck is 26.7 miles. So round trip, that's about 52 miles. When you get back to the shop, you just plug it in. Now you can have a fast charger and juice it back up, or you can have an overnight charger and juice it up very slowly. Um, the vast majority of light delivery is local, five to 10 miles. Groceries, pharmaceuticals, car parts, all this stuff, all the municipalities. They don't drive very far, but they usually run the air conditioning all day. And these do have air conditioning, they have power steering and they have heat, and you can run the air conditioning for about 30 hours on a single charge. And so essentially the idea is that um, if you charge them overnight, it's carbon neutral, right? Is that the... Right, because the energy that is generated at night is surplus energy. Nobody's using it, but you can't just shut the plant down and wait for 6 a.m. So they idle the plant all night. And that's why our development partners, Duke Energy and some of the other uh, TVA, they're very excited about the project because it allows them to sell some of the electricity that they're just having to send to the ground. Mm -hmm. Is there any risk of, uh, and I, I, some years ago I w went to Tesla and test drove one of the uh, roadsters and, uh, and I did inquire, I was interested in taking a look at the Model S, but it wasn't actually out in production at the time. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I had was, is there any kind of shielding to prevent the electromagnetic radiation from entering the cabin? Is that a, a factor that you think needs to be remedied and do you have any solution for that? It is a factor. Um, it is a factor with vehicles that use three phase AC motors. They have very high voltage inverters on board, 630 volts. So when you press that accelerator, you're putting an 80 to 90 kilowatt uh, three phase electric field all around your body. Most people are pretty nervous about putting a cell phone against their head. They're not real excited about driving around in, a mag in an electric field like that. And that's why very early on, one of our design parameters was to stick with DC. 
we have no inverter on the vehicle. Everything is DC, everything is shielded, and the motor sits all the way in the back of the vehicle, about seven feet away from the driver. There is no electric field that's harmful to you inside the cab. In fact, uh, it's kind of interesting. I drive the electric vehicle all the time, and I get a kind of euphoric feeling if I've been driving it for three or four hours. I drive it on the racetrack sometimes for five hours straight. Um, the reason is that the rotating DC magnetic field is actually healthful for human physiology. Um, any neurologist will tell you that deep brain, deep brain stimulation using these DC magnetic fields improves the cognitive abilities. Mm. Now, is that the same in technology in the Tesla or is the Tesla different? Radically different. Tesla is three phase AC. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Well, that's very interesting. And so when's your, uh, when do you expect at this point, um, if everything goes according to plan, that this uh, vehicle be available for purchase? Well, we're taking orders now, uh, especially for export, because uh, we don't have to worry about the uh, Department of Transportation or the EPA out there, um, out of jurisdiction. We're hoping that with the change of presidents in just a little bit, that the regulatory world will radically change and small business will actually be able to do something in America. But even if that stays the same uh, and it takes us uh, eight months to get through the airbag uh, program, it looks like next uh, late summer, August or September, these vehicles will be ready for purchase. Mm -hmm. So now I interview a lot of people from different backgrounds and there's a lot of talk about uh, exotic energy technologies out there, uh, free energy devices and so on. And, and of course, um, there have been cars that in the past that were, uh, and I think like, for example, are you familiar with Meyer who built the car that ran on water, right? Um, so why not use some sort of exotic energy technology so the car can run for longer distances? Um, frankly, We've surveyed well over a thousand uh, individual customers and no one's asked for longer distances. Everybody's pretty much happy with a hundred miles between charges. That's one reason. The other is, and we're probably the only car company that actually has this. We have a portal on our website called new tech. If you have any device like this, any power generation or power scavenging device, anything that will recharge batteries, we have a space for it in our truck. We can commercialize it, put it in the truck, and you will never have to worry about where your next meal is coming from. So far, it's been six years. We have never had a taker, not one. So do you think that's because inventors, as I've heard, a lot of them are afraid to bring their technologies to market, or do you think that there is nothing viable out there at the moment? Both. I talk to new inventors all the time and I ask them if they have a proof of concept. No. Do you have any drawings? No. Do you have a patent? No. Well, you know, I worked two jobs most of my life and I built my first electric vehicle in my spare time. You have to build your prototype. We are not in the business of building prototypes for people. You build a working prototype and bring it to us and we will treat you right. We're not going to steal your idea from you. That's not the reason we're here. That's not the reason we're in business. I'd like to uh, talk about your book called Remembering the Future. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I, I, I haven't read the book yet, but it sounds very fascinating. Now I know that it originated with your interest in the secret and and, and I actually, when The Secret first came out, I read it, uh, and I even... Um, did did you out. buy the scissors and the magazines? And Yeah, I even went uh, to, to the extent of hiring a lot of the, the, the teachers in The Secret to teach me, and uh -huh. uh, hired some of them as personal coaches and so on. And I, and I found that, that uh, some things actually worked out and other things did not, and, and I was even in a very um, small group of 
highly successful business people who were being coached by one of the individuals in secret. And I found that some of them achieved remarkable success while other than others failed miserably at uh, and applying the very same techniques that were mm-hmm. very advanced uh, law of attraction and neuroscientific techniques. And so now uh, your idea of this A times Fibonacci cycle, I find very fascinating. And <coughs> so can you explain some of that a little bit, how that works? Sure. Um, <coughs> Fibonacci was uh, an Italian philosopher that also dabbled in mathematics. I was actually teaching college algebra at the time, and you come across this section in the algebra book where you have to teach about Fibonacci. And I had some adult you know, students in my class, and I thought, you know, I'm going to teach this section on Fibonacci, and they're going to answer the two questions on the test, and they're never going to give another thought about it. I got to... I got to come up with something that gives them something that they can do with this Fibonacci. So I was, I was actually sitting there with my calculator and I was just going through the Fibonacci sequence. And I realized when you get out around 11 or 12 iterations, starting at zero, when you divide the previous number into the last number, it comes out to the golden mean, 1.618 to 1. I actually put it in a computer and what we call the variation, that is to say the distance off of that slope was so small, even in the third or fourth decimal place sometimes, it was pretty remarkable. So I asked the question, what happens if you take two numbers that aren't in sequence, that don't start at zero, take two numbers like... uh, 75 and 256. One's odd, one's even, they're not divisible. They don't even know each other. And let's just add them together. And that'll generate the third number and we'll start from there. I found that when I got out eight iterations, I divided the seventh into the eighth. I got the golden mean. I said, no way. Maybe, Maybe it only works with integers. No. It worked with uh, fractions. It worked with imaginary numbers. It even worked with functions and formulas. And I thought to myself, if, if it works with this, then it'll work with energy. So I said, there's got to be something to eight repetitions of the process before you hit this golden mean. I do know that in the golden mean, this is the way planets lay out, this is the way the periodic chart lays out. Any energy system that doesn't hit that resonation point can't exist, it becomes chaotic, it becomes feedback to itself and destroys itself, generates a lot of heat and feedback. So I just started developing the process from there and I realized that these two numbers don't have anything to do with each other. And I, was, I read The Secret, and I, I bought the scissors and bought the magazines, and I covered my refrigerator with all those pictures. And then, really, nothing happened. And I realized, well, the problem is I keep focusing on the picture of the motorcycle or the house or whatever it is that's on the fridge and not on what will actually get me that thing. And so I started asking people. I started doing interviews for the book. And I said, I asked people, what's your dream? And they would say, "Um, to have a million dollars. Well, why? And then they would tell me all the things they're going to do with a million dollars. And I would say, so really what you want are all these things. The million dollars is your plan for getting all those things. What if the universe doesn't have a plan like that? What if there's another plan for getting those things that you don't even know about that that will resonate with those things? And that's where I started coming up with the ideas that, look, if you if you hit a bell with a hammer and then you hold on to the bell, you're you're damping the vibrations. You can hit it as many times as you want. It's going to make the same sound over and over and over again, but you're not going to get, you know, what that bell can generate for you. If you let the bell go, which I call the release, and you smack it, and then you look around the room for those things that are vibrating with the energy of that bell, 
it means that those things are sympathetically resonating with that bell. So if you put energy into those things, they'll make the bell ring louder and louder and louder. And if you do that in such a way that you've created eight iterations in that, you now have manifested that idea. If you do it in the future, then the reality is you're sitting in the past where you can actually do something about it, but you got to know what to do. What email do I answer? What phone call do I take? What job do I take? Where do I move? Where do I look? What newspaper do I buy? That's what you become sensitive to. And those things start popping into place. So I interviewed baseball players. I interviewed golfers. I interviewed real estate people. And I asked them, how many times did you try to go to the majors from the minors before you made it? Eight. How many times did you try selling a house before you actually sold one and actually started to make things go? Eight. How many times did you play pro-ams before you finally went pro? Eight. Over and over and over again, it was this determination to stick with the things that support your idea. Not going out and, and looking at the picture on your refrigerator, but resonating, pouring energy in those resonating ideas and using that resonation to build your idea in the future. It has no choice but to manifest. It probably won't happen the way you think it's going to happen. In fact, that's most likely it's not going to happen the way you think it's going to happen. But one day you'll realize, wow, I got the motorcycle. And when you look in the past, it's going to look like the straightest line ever. But when you're in the past looking forward, you can't see it. So essentially, don't be attached to how the outcome will manifest. That's the main thing. Mm -hmm. Because people are going to ask you, oh, yeah, how are you going to accomplish that? Simply say, I don't know. I'm listening. And when I hear the right way, I'm going to pour energy into it. So has it proven that, so basically, if I want to achieve a, a particular outcome, let's say, first of all, my first question is, because we live in, especially in a westernized society where we're so conditioned by TV shows and media and so on, I think a lot of people don't really even know what they want. Um, a lot of people think they want the same things. Everybody wants the big house and the fancy car when a lot of them are probably, some of them may be happier being farmers without the big house and the car. But, and so there's this, I think, um, uncertainty a lot of people have about what it is they want in the first place. Do you think that everyone is, let's say 10 people all say, I want a million dollars in the big car and the house. Is it possible that maybe half of them aren't going to get it because that's really not what they really need or what they <laughs> came into this life to have? Well, in the book, I have a section of how to properly dream. Here's where most people get caught up in things, especially, you know, people in the West. Um, there are three aspects to this. One is being. What do you want to be? I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a teacher. I want to be a musician. Next one is doing. And the last one is having. What everybody does is they say, I want to have. And what I tried to teach them in the book, forget about that. Be and do and the having will come. In fact, when the have does come, you probably won't even care about it. So be who you want to be and do the things that you want to do and let the have take care of itself. Yeah, I mean, so do what you want to do. Basically, it means get off the porch and go to work. You can't sit on the porch and want to win the lottery. You got to go buy a ticket. You got to do the work to get there. If you want to be a musician, you got to practice. You got to get that instrument and train your muscles to do what it is they do. And then you'll be a musician. If you want to be a teacher, you know, you have to do the affiliated education to get into that field. So these are the, this is the process. I call it the solids. The having part is where most people get trapped. 
And this is the main reason they get depressed. You know, I, I talked to a woman one day and I said, what's your dream? She said, to have a big house and marry a rich man. I said, so what happens when you get those two things? Todd to die? Your life is complete? And she got the weirdest look on her face like, well, no. Look, you, you got to think about things. I can tell you right now, I've had a big house. You know how hard it is to keep a big house clean? <laughs> when your four kids move out and it's just you and your wife at a 6,000 square foot house, it's time to downsize, time to simplify. Those big houses don't mean anything. And, and so on this path, you can expect to fail at something seven times before you achieve the eighth. That's pretty consistent, it sounds like. Not necessarily. The failure is asymptotic. You won't make the same level of failure the seventh time as you did the first. That failure will get smaller and smaller and smaller, and you'll find this kind of zone feeling coming over you where it doesn't matter where you drop back to, when you shoot the ball, it goes in the basket. So it's actually interesting from a business standpoint because I've, I've read a lot of books on business and things like that over the years as well. And, and a lot of people speak about how they failed more times than they've succeeded. And so the key to success is really failing more often. Well, failure is a much better teacher than, than success. That's easy to say. I mean, it's kind of gauche. But you're absolutely right. If you go talk to people that are worth you know, seven figures plus, ask them, how many times did it take you really to get to this point? I mean, you sell kids toys, you sell bathroom soap, you sell lawn care items. How did you get to this point? And they'll tell you, it's a tough road. It was not all peaches and cream for them. They had to work to get to that point. Now they're in the zone. Now they're doing what they want to do and they are what they want to be. Are there any connections to ancient wisdom or other than Fibonacci that, that show you this correlation between that eight cycle? I go back to the Sefer Yetzera. It's uh, the oldest uh, section of the Kabbalah. It's kind of a, it's hard to draw on flat paper because it's kind of a three dimensional thought. But the idea is that there are 10 dimensions. Now you can't really live in all 10 dimensions but you can put energy into those 10 dimensions. And once you create this kind of Merkaba, this kind of structure, then, uh, you know, successful energy will be yours. I see. And, and so it refers to this eight as a, as a period of time that it requires to do that. No, it doesn't. That's the Fibonacci process. But uh, the ancients believed that it was a, it was an agreement of energy that created success. And if that agreement wasn't there, it didn't matter how big your army was, you were doomed to fail. Now, we've talked about a lot of interesting things today and um, we're living in a very interesting world at this time where there are just incredible advancements in so many areas, such as even, even having an electric car after such a long time available as a mainstream option is a huge step. Cars that drive themselves, the internet, all these kind of things, a massive spiritual awakening taking place. All the while there are wars and common core and all, all these kind of things. It, from your observation and, and even from maybe uh, more of an analytical standpoint, do you think we're headed in the right direction toward a more enlightened future, a more positive future, or are we still at that tenuous place where it could go either way? Well, I think generally we are in a world of chaos. There is a lot of powerful energy doing a lot of things that are, well, not supportive of a peaceful world or even a peaceful country. I think that the silent majority, these people that we call them cheek turning people, they're really the real Christians, the people, if you slap them, they, they won't slap you back. They'll just turn their cheek and say, you know, if you want to hit me again, you can, but I'd rather that you didn't. Um, 
But there are those in this world that are taking advantage of that and they want to enforce their will on others. And there's also the environment of the internet. It, it doesn't create any direction for you. I know that a lot of people have anxiety about it. It creates depression in them. And this, this is something that individually we have to overcome. I really think in maybe elementary school, we need to start addressing the interface between humans and technology. What does it really mean? How do we handle it? How do you deal with the extra stress, the unsurety, the variation that the electric world or electronic world puts into our lives? Um, I mean, you turn the news on, there isn't a kid that I know that wants to graduate college. They don't think that by the time they graduate college, the earth is even going to be here. We're headed for such a cataclysm. And that's the way it is if you turn the 24-hour-a-day news on. Are we empowered to do anything about this? Absolutely. But we have to act as a society. And we're just not used to doing that. So it is going to take a collective consciousness, a kind of um, renaissance, I would say, where we realize the spirituality of mankind. I'm always taken aback at the number of people today who say they're atheists. This is incomprehensible to me. Not that I'm a highly religious person anymore. I was. I taught Sunday school for 30 years. I sort of graduated from it. But there is a spiritual aspect to the existence here on this world that is highly satisfying, very gratifying, even if you're facing a tremendous challenge, illness or poverty or, you know, divorce or, you know, devastation of one kind or another, be it weather or be it financial. There is a way to overcome all this. And you don't have to die to do it. You can be alive and do it. All of this is within your reach. So it's a message of hope, even though everything we turn on from the time we wake to the time we go to sleep is trying to tell us there is no hope. So hopefully programs like yours will reach more and more people and that awakening process will accelerate till it reaches a critical mass. So we've talked about a lot of your books and projects uh, in this conversation today. Can you give us some, um, and I assume your books are all available on Amazon and other sure. uh, online booksellers, right? What, can, you, can you list out your various books and also where we can get, uh, get involved in your work and maybe even find out about the car or the truck that you're selling? Sure. Uh, the first four books, which make up about 2,000 pages, are the Ark of Millions of Years series, volumes one through four. Um, they basically cover the advent and destiny of the earth and how ancient civilizations and us, modern civilizations, fit into that not just from a historical or religious, but also a scientific point of view. Honestly, uh, my co-author and I, E.J. Clark, wrote the first book. It was 560 pages. And I said, well, E.J., you buy five copies, I'll buy five copies, and we'll call ourselves authors. Well, five months later, you know, it was number 38 on Amazon. I was absolutely blown away how many people were interested in this subject. So then my fifth book was called Remembering the Future, The Physics of the Soul and Time Travel. It sold pretty well. But the last book is called Alienated Nation, The, the uh, New Path to Liberty. This was a book that crossed over between civics and government. And um, it basically talked about an event which we now call um, the States Convention or the Convention of States, it's an Article 5 in the Constitution, allows a certain number of states, about 38 of them, to get together and say, we're going to amend the Constitution and we're going to reclaim powers that you took from us that we did not enumerate to you, federal government, and we're going to undo the agency government. The 650 agencies that now rule this country are dissolved. We're going to run them a different way. If we can pull that off, we can save this republic. That book went to number one in civics and government. 
and uh, I, I, it was amazing. It beat uh, Rachel Maddow, it was up there with uh, Mark Levin, and it got people started on the idea that, man, there is something we can do about this, and it's legal, and it's peaceful. So that's where my efforts have been, at least with my radio program the last couple of years. I am working on another book. I wrote a screenplay called Birth. I'm now changing it into a, a book because uh, difficult, more difficult to get a movie made if you don't have a book for the screenplay. And your, uh, your radio program is called X Squared, right? X Squared Radio. And where do we find the, what are all the URLs for the various uh, projects? Um, XSquaredRadio.com. And uh, that is the central linking website to everything else. The car company, <coughs> uh, all of the books. Um, of course, you can go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble and read all about the books too. Um, X Squared Radio is on every Sunday night from 8 to 11 Eastern. Uh, it's live, it's call-in, it's raw, and uh, we, we cover the current news and the past and the future and blend the science and spirituality all together for three hours. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking time to speak with me today. It's been a pleasure getting to know you and learning about all of your work. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back on the show again in the near future. Ethan, I've had a wonderful time. I cannot wait to see the production. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Awaken Empowered TV with my special guest, Brooks Agnew. Join us next week as we speak with another incredible individual who is standing on the leading edge and changing the world.